So ask yourself the question. People who know you, would they know you as someone who trusts God, who obeys God, someone who attempts to walk in His will, or do they just know you as a person who sort of just does whatever comes naturally and you want to be happy and you want to be successful and you want to fit into the ways of the world? God did not allow you to be born just to do any old thing you wanted to do. That wasn't His plan. Watch carefully as the Apostle John defines darkness in his context. Darkness comes in a lot of different ways, but what John's talking about here is understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you will acknowledge that work and agree with what the Holy Ghost is doing in your life, you won't walk in darkness. Welcome to Diggin' Deeper, a simple Bible study where we go digging deeper into the Word of God. Thank you for joining me today. I am your host, Billy Ray Parrish, and we have completed the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis made up of 50 chapters. The book of Genesis is a very hard-hitting book and can be difficult to understand. And this is one reason why we have these studies. We want to go deeper than just each verse because we want to fully understand the verse and its context. Today's program will be over chapters 41 through 50. And if you'd like a refresher on the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, please review any of our studies, reviews, and or rereads. All of this is found in the library. This is fun for me because I want to take the time to help the readers read through the these chapters so this study is a refresher on Genesis. Genesis chapter 41 takes place with two years having passed since the Pharaoh freed the cupbearer and restored his life and executed the baker by execution of hanging. From chapter 40 to chapter 41, two years has passed by and the Pharaoh himself has a dream. Pharaoh's dream had him standing by the Nile River, then out of the river come seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then another seven cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. Research reveals that the two Hebrew phrases used here can literally be interpreted as terrible, looking and thin of flesh. It was a life-like experience. And while it was a dream, it was also a message from God. Pharaoh wakes up and knows that the experience was not just a random event and was troubled by it. After falling asleep, he has another dream this time. He saw seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. The King James Version, which we typically use here on Diggin' Deeper, uses the word corn instead of grain. But during this period of history, corn did not exist. This does not mean that it's an error, but an example of how language can change things. As in the first dream, there were seven cows and another seven came forth. Here, there are seven crops of grain or corn and then another seven ears thin and blighted by the east wind, so it appears the second set of seven grain heads seen by Pharaoh look like they've been parched and ruined by this blasting desert wind. Pharaoh's actions let us know that he knows something about the dreams were troubling. And if the dreams were more than just dreams, ruined crops could be catastrophic. Before he wakes up, he sees the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. What could this mean for Pharaoh? Pharaoh was uncertain and troubled by the dreams so he sent forward for anyone who could help, including magicians and advisors or wise men. He knew something wasn't right and wanted to understand what. During ancient cultures such as Egypt, 
there existed a lot of false traditions like medicines, spiritism, and mysticism mixed with religion as methods to reach the divine. In the previous chapter, Joseph had said that knowledge of dreams belonged to God. And while Pharaoh knew something was not right, he did not have the knowledge to go to God to interpret these dreams. The ways in which he went about interpreting the dreams were unable to reveal deeper knowledge and meaning, and when there was no real answer given, the cupbearer spoke up and mentioned the name of Joseph. He tells the Pharaoh of his experience when he and the baker were thrown into jail and had dreams that confused them both, but Joseph had accurately interpreted them. Pharaoh had to be impressed by this. And while we are unsure whether he believed the cupbearer completely, he was desperate, so he sent for Joseph. The old saying desperate times call for desperate measure. And while the other methods had failed, perhaps Joseph can be of assistance. We are not told but maybe Pharaoh trusted this man and sent for Joseph without hesitation. Although the cupbearer did mention Joseph's name to Pharaoh. It took him two years to do so, and when Pharaoh sent for Joseph, he shaved and changed his clothes and came in unto Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells Joseph that he is a dream and needs an interpret, but nobody can do so. But he has heard of the good works from Joseph. But Joseph responds that it's God, not him, that can give a good answer. Pharaoh tells Joseph the dreams that he had and the visions that he saw. Joseph listens and responds. The dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Or God means to show Pharaoh exactly what he is about to do on the earth. Joseph further explains the seven thin cows. And seven thin heads of grain represent a second time period, one of famine. This shortage will be so severe that it will entirely undo the seven years of abundance. And while this may not be good news whatsoever, the situation can turn dire really quick. There is hope as Pharaoh knows, so he can act accordingly. There will be good times and bad times as seven years of prosperity will be upon the land but followed by seven years of famine. The famine will be horrendous as it will devastate and consume the land of Egypt. The situation will be so bad that all the good that had been experienced prior will be forgotten. And because Pharaoh had two dreams, these events will come to pass and quickly. The events were fixed, and there's no reversing the decisions. Joseph does inform the Pharaoh that he needed to put together a team of wise and discerning men to manage the crisis that will fall upon the land, and he does. Joseph informs them to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. This should serve to us as a lesson to be prepared for bad times as an emergency. It is not beneath any of us, and Joseph was teaching the Pharaoh and his people to be prepared for what was about to come. The food collected during the good times will serve as reserves during the bad times. While Pharaoh may not have liked hearing what was to come, he took Joseph's advice and did what was instructed, asking if there was anyone else in the land that was filled with God. When Pharaoh refers to Joseph as a man like this, he's not being condescending or belittling Joseph, but he understands that Joseph is full of knowledge and full of God's spirit. Pharaoh goes as far in saying to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Thou shalt be over my house. And according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Here, Pharaoh appoints Joseph to be his second in command over all of Egypt. Think about how quick things had changed for Joseph. He woke up in the morning in prison after two years of interpreting dreams for two men. And now, he's being summoned to interpret dreams for the Pharaoh. And then, being made second in command. When God says the time is right, 
Nobody can stop what is coming which was true for what would hit Egypt and for each individual striving for God's plan. Pharaoh repeat his plans for Joseph and repeating something more than once was an indication of importance to illustrate to Joseph the changing of status and his token of appreciation Pharaoh hands over his signet ring as well as fine clothes and a gold chain. His life has truly changed. Joseph was not only dressing differently as a high-ranking official in Egypt was expected to look a certain way, but he was also traveling differently as he was riding in one of Pharaoh's chariots. Pharaoh addresses just how much authority Joseph has explaining, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Joseph has his name changed and is given a wife from Pharaoh. His name was changed to Zaphnath Pania. And he gave him to wife Asenath the daughter of Potipharah priest of On. This may have been the same Potiphar who Joseph worked for and later arrested Joseph. There is a lot of research that indicates this may be the same guy. But we are not sure as his. Whereabouts after Genesis chapter 39 The name change has been discussed. And while there is not a consensus about the name, it translates to something similar to someone that God speaks to or a revealer of secrets. When all of this happens, Joseph was 30 years old which means from the time he was arrested and imprisoned and this list of events, 13 years had passed. Joseph leaves Egypt and the seven years of prosperity does occur. And he collects the food as he instructed. The Bible tells us that Joseph gathered up and stored as much food as the sand of the sea. That's truly a lot. Before the famine hit, Joseph had two children from Asenath. The firstborn Manasseh translating as God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. And the second Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. As God had informed Joseph, the seven years of prosperity would end and the famine would hit. It did. But when it did, there was bread in Egypt. The people cried for bread during this famine and Pharaoh told the people to go to Joseph and do as he instructed them. Pharaoh had complete confidence in Joseph. Despite the measure of collecting money through taxes, the Egyptians did not starve and had food to eat during this trying time. The famine was a worldwide event and people from all over came to Egypt to buy from Joseph. And this would increase Egypt greatly which seemed to happen to anything and everything Joseph touched. Spurgeon writes in regards to Genesis chapter 41 verses 1 through 7. Pharaoh's nightmare has too often been my waking experience. My days of laziness have ruinously destroyed all that I had achieved in times of zealous industry. My seasons of coldness have frozen all the genial glow of my periods of fervency and enthusiasm. And my fits of worldliness have thrown me back from my advances in the divine life. I needed to beware of lean prayers, lean praises, lean duties, and lean experiences because these will eat up the fat of my comfort and peace. If I neglect prayer for ever so short a time, I lose all the spirituality to which I had attained. If I draw no fresh supplies from heaven, the old corn in my granary is soon consumed by the famine that rages in my soul. When the caterpillars of indifference or worldliness or self-indulgence completely desolate my heart and make my soul languish, then all my former fruitfulness and growth in grace avails me nothing whatsoever. Genesis 42 shifts away, somewhat, from Joseph back to his family in Canaan. The end of chapter 41 revealed a worldwide flood and this was impacting Jacob and Joseph's brothers. News reached Joseph's family back in Canaan that you can buy grain in Egypt. But what they do not know is Joseph is second in command. Ten of Jacob's sons head to Egypt. He had twelve 
but Joseph was already in Egypt, and Benjamin was left behind. The reason for not sending Benjamin was Jacob did not want to lose another child, especially one that belonged to Rachel. Think about what has been done over the last 20 years, including God. Using Joseph's ability to interpret dreams to place him as second in command over the entire nation. When the brothers arrived in Egypt, they bowed down to him. But this does mean they knew it was Joseph. In fact, they didn't recognize him, but they were in a position of need. And typically, when you're in need, you become humble. They did. Joseph recognized his brothers, but he did not acknowledge them asking where they came from. At this point Joseph is nearly 40 and wearing official Egyptian clothing. Seeing his brothers made Joseph think of them, remember his youth. At first, Joseph accuses his brothers of being foreign spies, which was a crime punishable by death. If the brothers were spies, the meaning of nakedness of the land would imply they were sent to determine the vulnerabilities of the land. The brothers do deny being spies, but admit to being there to buy food. They refer to themselves as servants, which can be seen as one sign Joseph's dreams were coming. True as they bowed down before Joseph. Jacob had used the same tactic with Esau referring to himself as Esau's servant despite having the birthright and his position. The brothers do not recognize Joseph by appearance. But his name has been changed to Zaphonath Paniah, and it seems like Joseph wants revenge. Would be hard to blame Joseph for all that has been done to him. But his brothers insist they are not spies, but honest people wanting to buy food. Joseph reiterates they have come to determine the vulnerabilities of Egypt. But the response was surprising. It was said they were of twelve brothers of one man from Canaan, but one is no more. Joseph has to be pleased knowing Benjamin and Jacob were alive. And his brothers even remembered him, but why does Joseph keep insisting they were up to no good? Joseph makes a demand of his brothers to bring their youngest brother to him, or they will not return home. Now it's apparent that Joseph is testing his brothers, send one of you. And let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved. There's no way Joseph could have planned this beforehand. But calling that Benjamin was alive makes him want to see his brother again. Joseph puts his brothers into custody for three days. But his actions are not as some dictator out for blood. But a loving brother who wants to see his brother. Benjamin was Joseph's only full brother as both parents were the same. His other ten brothers were from Jacob, but through different moms. He tells the brothers to do as instructed, and they will live. Joseph knows the situation from the famine has been a dire one, so he tells his brothers to leave. One behind, and the other nine leave with their grain, which reversed his original plan. He instructs clearly to bring your brother in order to verify their honesty. But this is still a strange request. The brothers come to the conclusion they are punished for their wrongdoing to their other brother. Joseph, who they claim is no more. Reuben points out he was against the whole plan and alludes to his other brothers being responsible and blood was the price to pay. Remember, the brothers did not know Joseph was Joseph, so they assumed he was unable to understand their language, but Joseph overheard them and knew what they were saying. They were able to communicate prior because they used an interpreter. He went away, wept due to what he had heard, and took Simeon into custody. And the other brothers left. They leave with instructions for their journey. Another fact the brothers do not yet know. Joseph returned their money. They will soon find the money, but when the money is found, they begin to panic. They do not know Joseph returned the money, but somehow forgot to pay him and thought it was part of their punishment for what had happened nearly 30 years ago. 
they arrive home in Canaan and tell Jacob what happened, including the governor calling them spies and instructing them back home to retrieve their brother, Benjamin. They take their grain without knowing they still had their money. Jacob, hearing of the story, lashed out at the brothers holding them responsible for the loss of Joseph and now, Simeon. We are uncertain of exactly why Jacob lashed out at his sons. Reuben makes a bold command telling Jacob they will deliver Benjamin back to him. But if they do not, Jacob can kill his own two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, but Jacob refuses to send Benjamin. And it seems Jacob is saying it's better to count Simeon lost than to risk losing Benjamin. This declaration must have been extremely difficult for his other sons to hear a favoritism as it is never easy to hear and accept. Jacob has convinced himself losing Benjamin would cause his death. Charles Spurgeon wrote, in regards to the need for corn in comparison to grace, a pitiful plight. These sons of Jacob were overtaken by a famine. We may talk of famines, friends, but none of us know what they are. We have heard of a famine. In Ireland, and some dreadful stories have been related to us that have harrowed our hearts and almost made our hair stand up on end, but even there the full fury of famine was not known. We have heard too, to our great grief, that there are still in this city dark and hideous spots where men and women are absolutely perishing from hunger, who have sold from off their backs the last rags that covered them and are now unable to leave the house and positively perishing of famine. Such cases we have seen in our daily journals and our hearts have been sick to think that such things should now occur. But we cannot any of us guess what is the terror of an universal famine when all men are poor, because all men lack bread when gold and silver are as valueless as the stones of the street because mountains of silver and gold would scarce suffice to buy a single sheaf of wheat. Read the history of the famine of Samaria and see the dreadful shifts to which women were driven when they did even eat their own offspring. Famines are hells on earth. The famine which had overtaken Jacob was one which, if it had not at the moment of which this passage speaks, exactly arrived at that dreadful pitch, was sure to come to it for the famine was to last for seven years. And if, through the spendthrift character of Eastern nations, they had not saved in the seven years of plenty enough even for one year, what would become of them during the sixth or seventh year of famine? This was the state of Jacob's family. They were cast into a waste, howling wilderness of famine with but one oasis. And that oasis they did not hear of till just at the time to which our text refers, when they learned to their joy that there was corn in Egypt. Permit me now to illustrate the condition of the sinner by the position of these sons of Jacob. First, the sons of Jacob had a very great need of bread. There was a family of sixty-six of them. We are apt, when we read these names of the sons of Jacob, to think they were all lads. Are you aware that Benjamin, the youngest of them, was the father of ten children? At the time he went into Egypt, so that he was not so very small a lad at any rate. And all the rest had large families, so that there were sixty-six to be provided for. Well, a famine is frightful enough when there is one man who is starving when there is one brought. Down to a skeleton through leanness. And hunger but when sixty-six mouths are craving for bread. That is indeed a horrible plight to be in. But what is this compared with the sinner's needs? His necessities are such that only infinity can supply them. He has a demand before which the demands of sixty-six mouths are as nothing. He has before him the dreadful anticipation of a hell. From which there is no escape, he is upon him the heavy hand of God who has condemned him on account of his sins. Genesis chapter 42 ended with Jacob refusing to allow any of his family 
to return to Egypt, particularly his son Benjamin. As far as Jacob knew, Benjamin was the only son he had left from Rachel as he assumed Joseph was dead. Simeon was being held in Egypt by the Egyptian governor Joseph, or his Egyptian name, Zaphnath Paniah. As sad as it may sound, Jacob was willing to sacrifice Simeon rather than risk losing Benjamin, which is not a position any person should ever be in. As learned in chapter 42, Jacob held his other sons responsible for that happened to Joseph and Simeon, and even for the potential loss of Benjamin. As time passes, the food runs out so Jacob sends his sons back to buy more food. But the sons are unable to do so without Benjamin. At least, the sons cannot return and expect good results without Benjamin. Judah reminds Jacob of this fact, and we see here Judah starting to become a brave, an honorable man even getting collateral to Jacob. It does not take much reasoning to understand that without Benjamin, the mission will be impossible. And as we have learned in previous chapters about Jacob, He's stubborn, even though he's favored and blessed. And his stubborn ways keep him blaming the children for what has happened. He complains that they should not have told the governor there is another brother. It's a mystery to the brothers, to Jacob's sons, why the governor cares so much for their brother, but they know they cannot return without him. Obviously, the brothers did not think much about the questions as they were in a very tough position. They were facing starvation, the entire world was. And they were at the mercy of the Egyptian official, so they were going to answer whatever they could. They had no reason to lie to Joseph about their family. Judah asks Jacob to trust him with this brother, the boy, or the lad as he labels him in other translations in order that all of them might survive this famine. Judah was leading the charge to kill Joseph, but now, he's taking charge to do what was right. Judah promises to take personal responsibility for Benjamin's safety and he goes further, and offers himself as a pledge of safety. This is not some half-hearted pledge, but a real commitment. Obviously, there has been time wasted because Jacob's refusal to allow his sons to go back to Egypt. So Judah's statement, for except we had lingered, surely now we have returned the second time, is correct. If only they had left already, they would have been there. Jacob starts to realize that Benjamin must go with his brothers. And he wants to send gifts for the governor. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present, a little balm, and a little honey, spices, and myrrh, nuts, and almonds, and take double money in your hand, and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks. Carry it again in your hand, peradventure it was an oversight. Take also your brother, and arise, go again unto the man. Jacob's instructions of taking double the money was to cover both the cost of the new grain and the money mysteriously returned to their sacks after buying grain on the previous trip. And the other items was a similar tactic used with Esau and their reunion as Jacob was unsure how Esau felt. Jacob now sends the children off, but not before giving them over to God Almighty by praying that God will give them mercy before the Egyptian governor and that the man will send both Simeon and Benjamin back home with their other brothers. Jacob seems to accept whatever happens as God's will. It could be read in different ways, but knowing Jacob's character, and the things he's done from the past, I believe he's saying that what happens, happens. And it's God's will. The brothers set out with the gifts, money, and Benjamin to head for Egypt. They stand before Joseph and Joseph orders an animal to be killed in order for his brothers to eat. He knows they are hungry, and the trip was hard on them. After all, the world is in a famine. When he sees his brothers, he realizes they have done as he instructed them. And more importantly, 
he sees not just the nine brothers, but Benjamin was well. We do not know how much catching up with Simeon he's done, I assume quite a bit. But now, he has the opportunity to do so much more. All of the brothers are allowed into the home just as Joseph had ordered. But the brothers were afraid because they're thinking they were going to be punished based on what happened with the money. They do their best to clear up the matter before they are attacked and forced into slavery, but this would have been irony as Joseph was sold into slavery. And now, they are fearful of being made slaves. In part, they explain and other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. They insist that they do not know who put the money back in their packs. The brothers are very surprised to the response of Joseph, Peace be to you, fear not, your God. And the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. He brings out Simeon. They give up the gifts and await the meal that they are to eat at noon. They give him the gifts and bow before him. Joseph asks them simple questions that probably did not make the brothers think. After all, some of these questions are referred to as interest. Or even small talk. Is your father well, the old man of whom he spoke? Is he yet alive? The brothers not knowing Joseph, he was asking how was his dad. Joseph had been away for nearly 30 years at this point, so the question meant a lot to him. When he learns about Jacob being well, he turns to Benjamin and inquires about him. All of this becomes too much for Joseph, so he has to excuse himself into another room where we weeps, he cries, because it's been over two decades since he saw Benjamin. Benjamin was the only brother not involved in the selling of Joseph into slavery. It was a custom during this period of time that Egyptians not eat with Hebrews. And while Joseph was a Hebrew, he had also been acclimated into Egyptian society. And he was also hiding his identity from his brothers, so he kept with the custom and did not eat with his brothers. This may also have something to do with Joseph's status as a governor. But the verse reads the Egyptians did not eat with the Hebrews. We are told that the brothers were seated according to their birth order. And they were amazed by this which, understandably so, as the steward had no way of knowing this fact. All of the brothers were served food, but Benjamin received so much more in regards to portions. Despite Benjamin getting so much more, the brothers do not seem to mind as they become merry in their surroundings. And this is where chapter 43 ends, a scene of brotherly love with food and relaxation. Chapter 44 begins with Joseph sending the brothers, including Simeon, off in good standing with their sacks filled with food. The sacks are filled with as much food as they can hold. And once again, Joseph sends the money back with his brothers. Unlike the last time, Benjamin accompanies his brothers. And Joseph instructs for his steward to put a silver cup in Benjamin's sack. And when the morning sun had come, the men departed from Joseph's presence. What happens next appears to be a change of heart from Joseph as he waits for his brothers to get ahead before he sends his men after them. He instructs his men, when they have caught up to his brothers, to ask why have you decided to repay evil for good? This question probably does not make a lot of sense at first. But repaying evil for good was in reference to the cup in Benjamin's bag. The steward asks is not this it in which my lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. The brothers do not know what the steward means by such a statement as they are innocent and have no idea of the cup in Benjamin's sack. Earlier in Genesis, Rachel had stolen some items from her dad, Laban. And once Laban had caught up to them, Jacob was bewildered by the accusations. And this was a similar picture except the brothers did not take anything. The brothers are correct that they returned the money they found and ask how could they steal any silver or gold. 
Good point as they were in the presence of Joseph and his men the entire time. The brothers are very confident in their innocence and that none of them had taken anything that a bold statement is made with whomsoever of thy. Servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. Not only are they offering their services of labor if one has stolen, but the one that has stolen will be killed. However, the steward changes the stipulations. He will take the guilty party as his slave, and the rest will go free. Each brother lowers their sacks to reveal what each bag holds. The steward searches from the oldest to the youngest, and the cup was in Benjamin's sack. It does appear with the way things have turned out. Joseph has performed another task on his brothers. The brothers grieve their loss of Benjamin, their perceived loss of Benjamin, by tearing their clothes, but they do not leave their brother behind. They do not leave Benjamin and returned to Canaan, so they have grown in more than twenty years since they sold Joseph into slavery, but this probably hurt Judah most due to the promises he had made Jacob. He took personal responsibility for Benjamin. All eleven of the brothers returned to Egypt, to the house of the governor. And when they go into the house, they fall to the ground. This is a sign of respect and humility, but they are also desperate and looking for mercy from the governor. Joseph responds with a question, What deed is this that ye have done? Know ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? Joseph is still playing the part of an Egyptian official. Judah speaks up and over the last few chapters, he has grown into a real leader. He asks the simple yet complex question, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? Rather than attempt to argue, he throws himself on Joseph's mercy. Perhaps the brothers are still thinking they are being punished for what they did to Joseph so. Many years ago, and this may be the guilt spoken of, Joseph responds, God forbid that I should do so. But the man in whose hand the cup is found he shall be my servant. And as for you, kid you up in peace unto your father. Judah does not accept this and is staying by Benjamin's side. Further, Judah responds, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. Judah may be softening Joseph up with descriptions like servant, my Lord and Pharaoh, but more importantly, Judah is trying to get his brother freed. He has made a vow to Jacob to bring Benjamin home, and asks Joseph if he is a family, a dad, or brother. Joseph does not want to give away his plan, but Judah really plays on his emotions, explaining that their dad is old, and that Benjamin is the only child left from his mom because the other child is dead. Judah is not lying, and as far as he knows, Joseph is dead. But Judah is not trying to mislead or lie to Joseph. For the moment, it appears to have worked as Joseph commands for Benjamin to come forward so he can lay eyes on him. Judah adds that Jacob will die if they do not return with Benjamin. Judah continues telling the story to Joseph just how it happened with Jacob when they returned. Home to Canaan, and when a story is repeated in scripture, it's typically of significance. Benjamin has become the preferred son, since Joseph is seemingly no more. Jacob does tell his nine sons, And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Meaning if something happens to Benjamin, after it has happened to Joseph. And with Simeon in prison, he will die. While all of this is a play to tug at Joseph's heart, it's true. Judah took responsibility for Benjamin, if I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. He may have been a confused, envious, and jealous man many, many years ago, but he's truly become a leader. 
He pleads with Joseph to allow Benjamin to return with him. I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad of bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. Judah does not want to think about or see what will happen to Jacob if he returns without Benjamin. The plea he makes to Joseph is not selfish, it's in fact selfless. And he's trying to save the lives of both Benjamin and Jacob. Genesis chapter 44 ended with Joseph continuing to test his brothers. Up until this point, his brothers had not recognized him. And he is taking advantage of this one could this. After his brothers did as they were instructed and brought Benjamin back to Egypt, Joseph wept. Remember, Joseph had not seen his brothers in many years. And Benjamin was his only full brother. Rachel died in childbirth with Benjamin. And all of this brought back real emotions for the humble leader. As we reach the 45th chapter of Genesis, Joseph is overcome by Judah's bold leadership. And character, the fact his dad, Jacob, is still alive. And the sight of all his brothers in front of him and cannot hold back anymore. He orders everyone but his eleven brothers out of the room. When the room is filled with just Joseph and his brothers, he continues to cry loudly. The picture painted by scripture featured a lot of people in the house. And they could hear Joseph weeping. The moment finally came when Joseph revealed his real identity. He explains he is Joseph and asks if Jacob still lived. But the brothers were shocked, in real dismay at his presence, and could not answer. Maybe the brothers were uncertain at what was taking place, so Joseph told them to come closer and again, explained he's the one they sold into slavery. He wants to convince them. The picture of Joseph here illustrates such a godly man. Although his brothers sold him into slavery, he does not want them to feel burdened at what they've done. Joseph had a real connection with God. And this is evident throughout the last several chapters so Joseph has spent a lot of time thinking about how the events played out and why. He explains that this was all a part of a plan as God sent him there to save lives. Further, Joseph explains for these two years hath the famine been in the land. And yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. This should make each of us think about our own position in life and why we are where we are as God has a plan for everything. By the statements made in this chapter, it's obvious that Joseph understands his circumstances were not just random, or by chance, but God had a purpose for everything that happened. This is very difficult to keep in mind when we are going through bad times. But God does have a purpose for all that we go through. When we think about Joseph and his rise to power, from Hebrew slave to being second in command in Egypt. It's hard to argue that something divine was at play. Joseph was still, in reality, a Hebrew slave. But the Pharaoh listened to all the instructions given by Joseph. And this was clear when Joseph explained what Pharaoh was to do before the famine hit Egypt. This was indeed an example of a family reunion filled with brotherly love. But Joseph wanted something more, his dad Jacob. He instructs his brothers to go get Jacob and bring him to Egypt. Maybe Joseph has not thought it all through. Or maybe he is based on his statements and instructions, but he has plans for the entire family to move to Egypt to be near him. His dad, children, and grandchildren can all live near him in the fertile region of Goshen. Along the Nile River, Joseph does not want to do his brothers harm despite all the evil they had done to him, and he offers them protection. Joseph explains to his brothers that there are five years of famine to come, and wants them to pass the news of Jacob that the family does not have to worry about poverty. Without question, Joseph has forgiven his brothers for everything that has happened, made peace with it, and understands it as something divine rather than happenstance. 
and offers them safety, peace, and security during hard times to follow. But it should not be surprising to learn that all of this happened a bit fast for the brothers to comprehend. Joseph points out Benjamin being able to see him. And this might have to do with the relationship Jacob has with Benjamin. Joseph does his best to convince them that what they are seeing is true. Joseph explains this with a sense of urgency and tells them to go to Jacob and bring him to Egypt and in a scene of brotherly love Joseph and Benjamin hug and both cry aloud but it was not just Benjamin Joseph embraced all of his brothers kissed them and wept over them maybe the other brothers cried we are not told or maybe they were too shocked at what they were witnessing to fully comprehend it all the news appears to reach Pharaoh of the situation between Joseph and his brothers and they seemed pleased by the news. And this further illustrates that Joseph had been honorable in Egypt. If the Pharaoh of the land is happy that a Hebrew is family, and they are visiting, you have done good work. Pharaoh even chimes in and instructs Joseph's brothers, Lay your beasts, and go, get you unto the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. The Pharaoh of Egypt was providing a safety and security to Joseph's family, another sign of the respect Pharaoh had for Joseph. Indeed, Joseph was blessed and highly favored. Pharaoh is not offering just to protect Joseph's family, but offering all that Egypt has to offer the very best. Pharaoh instructs Joseph S. brothers to take wagons from the land of Egypt to carry your little children and your wives and bring your father here. Even if the family has to leave some goods and belongings behind, Pharaoh does not want them to worry because they will have everything that Egypt has to offer. Eventually, the brothers do comprehend what has been instructed and they set out for Canaan and each brother had new clothes for the journey ahead. Perhaps Joseph provided them with new clothing, or cloaks as suggested by some resources. Due to the jealousy they felt over Jacob giving Joseph a cloak of many colors. But he gives Benjamin extra clothing and 300 pieces of silver. It appears that Joseph wants to use the money to convince Jacob of his position and status of his life in Egypt. Joseph sends gifts to Jacob, as well, made up of ten donkeys carrying the best products of Egypt, and ten female donkeys carrying grain, food, and provisions for his father on the journey. He sends his brothers off on this journey back to Canaan to retrieve rest of the family. But his command to not quarrel or bicker is a bit funny when you think about all that has transpired. His brothers are competitive. But they are also serious as they have been blaming themselves a lot for what has happened and Joseph instructs them not to. The brothers leave Egypt and arrive in the land of Canaan and explain to their dad that Joseph is alive and he is ruler of Egypt. Depending on the translation, ruler or governor is used. But either way, Jacob did not believe his sons. After all, his sons had convinced them many years back, two plus decades, that Joseph had been killed and now they're trying to convince him that he lives. Eventually, his sons convince Jacob they are telling him the truth and his spirit is revived. Maybe it was the clothes sent from Joseph, the money, the empty carts to pack up everyone. But Jacob was convinced, but we are not sure if the brothers told the complete truth about what. They had done previously, but Jacob is happy Joseph lives and sets out to see his son before his death. Not only did God protect Joseph over the last 30 plus years and brought him to great prominence in Egypt, but he's also protected Jacob and his family and now has made it possible for a reunion as they get ready to travel to Egypt. 
verses 23 and 24 are instructions for how the brothers are to travel including not to fall out or quarrel. Spurgeon explains, This was a sure sign that Joseph knew his brethren, and they might well recognize him even by that precept. For their consciences must have told them that it had been their common habit to fall out either, with or without occasion, so he bids them not to do so. When Joseph's brothers arrived in Canaan and explained to Jacob what has happened, Spurgeon notes, See how quickly the patriarch changes from Jacob into Israel when his spirit if revived. He becomes Israel. Genesis chapter 45 ended with Jacob agreeing to go to Egypt to see Joseph before he dies. The Pharaoh was happy for Joseph that his family was alive and provided them with protection and all that Egypt had to offer so Joseph's family would be taken care of during the famine because Joseph was blessed and highly favored. Chapter 46 begins with a journey back to Egypt. But first, The caravan goes through Beersheba where he offers animal sacrifices to his dad, Isaac, at the altar. At night, Jacob has a vision where God is speaking to him, calling out Jacob, Jacob. And Jacob records, Here I am. Notice God uses Jacob, not Israel, but regardless of the name used, it's the same person. God tells Jacob, not to be worried about going to Egypt because he will make him into a great nation there. The promises are still alive even if Jacob is in a different land. God makes more promises to Jacob in this vision, including his offspring, will return to the promised land, and though he will die, it will be Joseph that closes his eyes. The dear son that he thought had died so long ago will be seen again alive and will be the one to close Jacob's eyes on a life well lived. The caravan leaves Beersheba in the wagons that Pharaoh has set with Jacob, and the family, and finally, arrives in the land of Egypt. Research reveals that it would have probably taken a month to make this trip, so the caravan had been gone for a while when they set back in Egypt. Verse 8 explains that there were 70 people that made this trip. And these seventy people will blossom a great nation of many. The first name on the list of Jacob and his sons is Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. From Reuben comes his children, Hanuk, and Phalu, and Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jachin, and Zohar. And Shal the son of a Canaanitish woman. Scripture does not say who Shal's mom was except for being a Canaanite woman. But the medieval French rabbi Rashi hypothesized that Shal was the son of Shechem and Dinah. Dinah being Jacob's daughter through Leah. And the sister of his twelve sons, this is just one explanation. And there is no way of knowing for certain if it's right or wrong. The sons of Levi Gershon, Kohath, and Merari the sons of Judah Er, and Onan, and Shelah, and Pharez, and Zerah, but Er. And Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Pharez were Hezron and Hamel. You might remember the Er and Onan were married to Tamar. But because of their wickedness and sinful nature Er, and Onan were put to death, executed by God. The New King James Version spells Pharez as Perez and one of his sons shares the same name as one of Reuben's sons, Hezron. Continuing on with the lineage is the sons of Issachar Tola, and Phuvah, and Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun seared, and Elon, and Yaliel. What I like about the way this genealogy is laid out is the explanation of how the children break down. For example, verse 15 tells us that the sons of Leah which he bore unto Jacob and Peyton Aram. With his daughter Dinah, all the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty and three. Dinah does go into Egypt with the family, but obviously, Er and Onan do not because of their deaths. 
continuing on with the sons of Gad Ziphion, and Haggi, Shuni, and Esben, Eri, and Arodi, and Areli, and the sons of Asher, Jimnah, and Ishwa, and Ishui, and Bariah, and Sarah their sister, and the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malkiel, the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah's daughter. And these she bore unto Jacob, even sixteen souls. These souls are the descendant through Jacob's servant wife Zilpah, according to the verses. Zilpah's descendants at this point in Israel's history number sixteen persons, including at least one daughter. Joseph's wife, Rachel, had just the two children Joseph and Benjamin. Benjamin being the youngest and Rachel died giving birth to him. Joseph's two children were Anasa and Ephraim from Asenath, the daughter of Petipherah the priest of On. Of course, Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim were already in Egypt, but they were included in the promise from God. The sons of Benjamin were Bela, and Becher, and Ashbel, Gera, and Naaman, Ahai, and Rosh, Muppim, and Huppim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel, which were born to Jacob, all the souls were fourteen. Next are the children from Bilhah whose first son is Dan. Dan's only son is Husham. The sons of Naphtali Jaziel, and Guni, and Jezer, and Shilam. These were the sons of Bilhah, the servant given to Rachel by her father, Laban. The number of Jacob's descendants through Bilhah was seven. According to the chapter, the total number of Jacob's direct descendants who went with him to Egypt, not counting his sons' wives, was sixty-six. Up to this point, the number adds in Dinah, Jacob's daughter by Leah, who was left out of the count of Leah's offspring, but removes Er and Onan, and does not include Joseph or his two sons. The sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls, all the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten, or, in easier to understand English, seventy persons. There are seventy people in total when Jacob himself is added in along with Joseph. And his two sons, Jacob sends Judah ahead of the company to let Joseph know they are coming. Joseph was ready and anticipated the reunion with his family, especially his dad, Jacob. This was nothing the two had expected to ever occur, but God works in mysterious ways. According to scripture, Joseph went up to meet Israel's his father to Goshen and presented himself unto him, and he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Just as Joseph had done with his brothers, he wept with Jacob. Joseph had lived some type of live over nearly thirty years of time. Jacob says to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. This is said from a positive perspective, not one of negativity, but joy. Joseph meets people he did not know existed. But regardless of what had happened in the past, Joseph knows that he's blessed. After the reunion with the entire family, Joseph turns to preparing his family to meet the ruler and to secure their position in Egypt. He instructs the family when they are asked by Pharaoh their occupation, respond, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we, and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination. Unto the Egyptians, Joseph understands the customs of Egypt and wants to ensure the family's assimilation into Egypt, and that Pharaoh feels comfortable with the family and their abilities to tend livestock. More so, Joseph wants to take care for his family, and he understands the country better than anyone else, so it only makes sense for the family to. Listen to Joseph. Here are some words from Charles Spurgeon on Jacob. So let us learn from Jacob especially at the beginning of any fresh enterprise, to draw nigh unto God with special devotion. We cannot too often remember that great sacrifice by which we live neither can we too often 
present ourselves as living sacrifices unto the Lord. But now, plunging into the center of the text, I notice first that Jacob had a fear. His fear was natural. But secondly, his fear needed to be removed for God said to him, Fear not to go down into Egypt. And thirdly, his fear was removed most sweetly. And with confidence the venerable man went on his way. I need say no more on that point. Jacob was always anxious, and in his old age more so than ever. The sketch I have given may be the picture of some friend now present. And if it be so, I will hope that in my discourse he may hear cheering voices from the Lord God to allay his fears. May the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, make it so. Chapter 46 ended with Joseph preparing his family to meet the Pharaoh instructing them what they should do. Chapter 47 opens with Joseph introducing Pharaoh to the family and preparing the family to settle in Goshen. Joseph did not take all eleven brothers due to Egyptian culture as they were keen on the number. 5. Joseph was highly favored, but he still wanted to make the best impression. When asked of their occupation, the brothers respond just as Joseph instructed. Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. Based on their responses, they were respectful and honorable to Pharaoh, for to sojourn in the land are we come for thy servants have no pasture. For their flocks for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. This behavior was needed. Despite Joseph being second in command, he was still considered a Hebrew slave. And with the famine upon the world, being of the best character would go a long way with Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells Joseph that the land of Egypt is before thee and the best of the land make thy father. And brethren to dwell in the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. He is gracious and gives the family realm of the land, or the best of what Egypt has to offer. Pharaoh addresses Joseph, not his brothers. He makes it clear that he is giving Joseph the authority to grant their request, and instructs Joseph to put the most competent brothers in charge of the livestock. Another meeting is held with Pharaoh, this time with Jacob. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh to begin with. Pharaoh asks Jacob his age. According to the New Living Translation, Jacob responds, I have traveled this earth for 130 hard years. But my life has been short compared to the lives of my ancestors. Pharaoh treats Jacob with great respect. And knowing his great admiration for Joseph, this should not come as a surprise. Jacob further adds to his response to you. And evil have the days of the years of my life been. And have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. All of this was true. Jacob had been through a lot. And been done wrong, but has been greatly blessed. When the meeting was finished, Jacob blessed Pharaoh again. Think about how the different meetings went with Jacob and Pharaoh. And five of Joseph's brothers and Pharaoh. Jacob blessed him twice. That's significant. Pharaoh probably understood how powerful this was. Joseph's family seemed to own the land they inhabited and thus is an example of how God works. He provided for the family during a famine and God still does this today. It may not be a famine, but it could be. And Joseph's story is an important illustration of obedience and the importance of your crowd. Joseph gives food to his family. And the amount of food would depend on the descendants, but the famine was very severe. People were dying rapidly and running out of money. Joseph takes the grain and sells it for money, and he takes the money to Pharaoh's house. Joseph has the opportunity to take money for himself, but did not, he was very honest. As the money of the lands ran out, people were unable to buy food, saying, Give us bread, 
for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. Joseph responds, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle, if money fail. In other words, trading livestock for food. And thus would increase Egypt's wealth, but another year comes. And all the people have no money, and traded away their livestock. What now? They're still desperate. Their plea is their servitude for food, so Joseph buys all the land available. And Pharaoh has even more wealth at his disposal, including all the people who were servants. The only part of the land Joseph would not buy was set aside for the priests. They were already given an allowance and food from Pharaoh. The others who were servants would be provided for and expected to keep the ground or it would become useless. Joseph explains the servants would owe one-fifth to Pharaoh and keep four-fifths for themselves and their household. The people are happy because they can eat and feed their families, claiming, You have saved our lives. They were thankful. The 20% tax on the people's produce is still in effect today although Joseph's family was made up of migrants and foreigners in the land of Egypt, they were provided for. They were not part of the class of people who needed to sell their land. They thrived in Egypt. As four years passed, Jacob continues to age. At 147 years, he requests of Joseph, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me, bury me not, I pray thee. In Egypt, Jacob wants to be buried with his ancestors back in Canaan in the family tomb, and Joseph agrees to do so. The chapter ends with Jacob, listed as Israel in the chapter, bowing his head to pray. At the end of chapter 47, Jacob was anticipated the end of his life, so he made Joseph promise to him to bury him in a specific location with his fathers in Canaan rather than the land of Egypt. Joseph agreed. We are not sure exactly how much time has passed from chapter 47 to chapter 48, but Joseph takes his two sons Manasseh and Ephraim to see Jacob so that his father can bless them. As illustrated, Jacob is very weak, he's dying. And when Jacob learns that Joseph is there to see him, he sits up. But it seems it took all his strength to do so. When Joseph arrives, he tells Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan. And bless me, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee. And I will make of thee a multitude of people. And will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. One of the key promises God made to Abraham occurred way back in Genesis chapter 17. Verse 8, And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Here we see Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim continuing to listen to describe one of the central promises given to Abraham by God and the promises continue to take place through Jacob. Genesis chapter 28 verse 3 features Isaac asking God to bless Jacob and his descendants, and God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. Note what happens next which happens in many occasions today, and now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee into. Egypt are mine as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Jacob formally adopts Ephraim and Manasseh as his own two sons, and they no longer were considered Jacob's grandchildren. This means they have the same privileges as Jacob's very own children. By mentioning Reuben and Simeon, Jacob seems to be ranking his two children ahead of the firstborn. Early in Genesis, we see Jacob taking the birthright from Esau. And now, his two children are being moved up. If it makes sense, 
the birthright would entitle Manasseh and Ephraim to double portions of their inheritances due to birthrights. Jacob adds that the other children will remain beneath the brothers. And this is the first mention of Joseph having other children. Jacob mentions the moment when Rachel had died, Joseph's mom. And this may be Jacob thinking about his coming death, and a reunion with his wife, and, or, his way of honoring Rachel by raising the children in rank. Jacob has learned much in his life, including from his own mistakes and choices. It was Rebecca and Jacob who stole away Esau's birthright, and they were able to exploit Isaac due to his poor eyesight. Here, on his dying bed, Jacob asks who are they in reference to his two grandchildren. Now children, Manasseh and Ephraim. And whatever blessings are given cannot be reversed, so he was ensuring that he was blessing them. Right children, Joseph was honest and had no intentions to deceive. Jacob tells Joseph to bring them close so he can bless them. Jacob loved his children and grandchildren and kissed them before he blessed them. The moment between Jacob and Joseph was beautiful. It was a moment that neither had thought possible. Jacob thought Joseph had died long ago. And Joseph probably never thought to see Jacob alive again. But here the two are shortly before Jacob dies. Jacob tells Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God has showed me also thy seed. Joseph prepares the children for the blessing taking Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. The ancient custom, or custom of ancient Egypt, had to do with the birthright to the oldest. And since Manasseh is the oldest, he was given the greater blessing, indicated by the right hand of the one giving the blessing. Jacob beings with a prayer that his offspring is blessed in the same way as he. And his dad and granddad were God, before whom my fathers Abraham. And Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. The angel which redeemed me from all evil blessed the lads. And let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. An indication that Jacob was old. And weak was inexplicably switching his hand to place his right hand on the younger brother's head. And his left hand on Manasseh, the oldest. Joseph was displeased with this. And it's likely Joseph thought his dad had made a mistake. But was it a mistake? Joseph tries to correct Jacob, pointing out, Not so. My father, for this is the firstborn, put thy right hand upon his head. Although Joseph had caught the mistake, most of the blessing had already been given. And the blessing would be irreversible. Apparently, though, it was no mistake as Jacob responds, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people and he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. The events that have just transpired let us know that Manasseh will become a people just like Ephraim, but Ephraim will become greater than Manasseh. His offspring will become a multitude of nations. Jacob continued with the blessing, and he shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh, and he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Jacob knew what he was doing, and he knows that he is about to die, and informs Joseph of this, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you, and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Before Jacob dies, he concludes that moreover I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. In other words, Jacob has just given Joseph a double portion of his inheritance by making Joseph's two oldest sons full heirs along with his brothers. Let's end on the words of Spurgeon from July 10, 1887. Our text tells us that Jacob blessed Joseph.
and we perceive that he blessed him through blessing his children, which leads us to the next. Remark that no choice or favor could fall upon ourselves than to see our children favor to the Lord. Joseph is doubly blessed by seeing Ephraim and Manasseh blessed. Dear young people, to whom I now speak, your fathers can say, we have no greater joy than this, that our children walk in the truth. If any of you who are unconverted knew the deep searching of heart of your parents about you, I think you would not long be careless and indifferent about divine things. And if you could conceive the flashes of heavenly joy that would light up your parents' hearts if they saw you saved in the Lord, it would be an inducement to you to consider your ways and turn unto the Lord with full purpose of heart. God himself, next to giving to his chosen the covenant of grace, can do them no greater earthly kindness than to call their children by his grace into the same. Covenant. Will you not think of this? Genesis chapter 49 opens up with Jacob on his deathbed, and he calls in his sons. Jacob knows his time is short. And as the head of his patriarchy, his last act is to give blessings to his children. It's interesting that Jacob describes himself as both. Jacob and Israel, and he calls his sons the sons of Jacob. And Israel which seems to be a battle on display, spiritually, as the sons of Israel. But also, the physical flesh Jacob. As the firstborn of the family, Reuben had claimed to the inheritance rights of the firstborn. But Reuben was told he would not excel. One reason for this had to do with Reuben's immorality with his dad's concubine Bilhah. Reuben is described as unstable as water. And while he remains the firstborn by order of birth, he lost his birthright. Or status, and unstable as water could signify his lack of morals and convictions. Simeon and Levi are tied together for different reasons. Obviously, they are brothers and have a brotherly relationship, it appears, a brotherly bond. But they also appear to do most everything together, including destroying an entire city after. Shechem, the prince, forced Dinah. It was not the slaying of Shechem and Hammer that Jacob detested, but it was their heinous and cruel acts that followed and because of these unnecessary and violent acts, their descendants will be scattered. The two brothers together cause so much destruction, just imagine what their descendants united together could do. Next up is Judah. And while the man had a rough start in life, he was not a good man to begin with. Jacob tends to redeem him, but explaining his brothers will praise him. Think about how Judah must have felt when he heard this declaration, especially the words, Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies, thy father's children shall bow down before thee. According to Jacob, Judah's people are destined for greatness. Jacob refers to Judah as a lion, first as a cub, then a lion, and finally a lioness. A lion takes down its prey and defies anyone to take it from him. The scepter is what a king holds in his hand, so Jacob is saying the rulership shall never leave. The tribe of Judah. Jacob's prophetic vision for Judah tells one of greatness and vastness as the vision tells of a people having more needed. So much so that donkeys are being tied to a grapevine. Zebulun's fate is a bit more simplistic than the greatness to come for Judah as his people are. Associated with sea trade. Jacob explains Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea can be translated looking towards the sea. Zebulun did look to the sea, both to the east and west. Issachar's people are depicted to resemble the sturdy, thick bone structure of a donkey. And due to their large size, they were the targets of other armies. The New King James Version describes the people as being slaves or forced labor as other translations read. The tribe of Dan will become independent and judge his people, but the vision for Dan has caused some confusion as the words from Jacob can 
be seen as either positive or negative. Positively speaking, Dan can be seen as a snake as small but capable of great things. Or negatively speaking, can be sneakiness and deceptive like the serpent in the Garden of Eden. There is a debate about which Jacob was referring to. Jacob seems to pause for a moment, praising God, exclaiming he has been waiting for God's salvation. But it could have served as a reminder to his sons to never forget. Not much is said of Gad, but his tribe apparently gets attacked. But in the end, Gad's tribe triumphs, which serves as a reminder that it's not about how you start, but how you finish and Gad seems to finish strong. Asher's people may not have a destination of kings and leadership, but they seem to be headed toward a life of happiness and wealth as it seems they are full of peace and wealth shall be rich or shall be fat as the King James Version reads. The vision for Naphtali is also simple as deer lets loose seems to be freedom. He is set free. And beautiful words probably indicate poetry or another form of speech and language. Next up is Joseph who is described as a vine being fruitful and fertile and a branch that extends over walls which tells us Joseph's tribe would multiply greatly. Despite the hatred toward Joseph from others or including his brothers, God's hands were on Joseph's hands as God was there, even when Joseph did not know it. Further, Jacob refers to God by five titles, the mighty God of Jacob, the shepherd, the stone of Israel, the God of your father, and the Almighty. In times of trouble and uncertainty, it's always good to remember that God makes good on all his promises. And this is evident with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is true still today. Jacob offers Joseph evidence for the promises of God being delivered in the form of his life. Story Benjamin is described as a ravenous wolf or a reputation for fierceness. Benjamin is explained as a wolf who hunts, tears, and devours from morning until evening. Jacob's words may not have been what the sons wanted, but they were what each son needed. And this marks the first time in scripture where the twelve sons of Jacob are listed as twelve tribes of Israel. Jacob is clear that he will soon die, and instructs his sons to bury him with his dad, and granddad in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite. He wants to be buried in the promised land, not Egypt. Abraham had purchased this land to bury Sarah after she had died from Ephron the Hittite. And this is where Genesis chapter 49 ends. Jacob, at the age of 147 years, dies. Charles Spurgeon explained, Jacob did not yield up the ghost until he had delivered the last sentence of admonition and Benediction to his twelve sons. He was immortal till his work was done. So long as God had another sentence to speak by him, death could not paralyze his tongue. The end of chapter 49 witnessed the death of Jacob. And chapter 50 opens with Joseph crying. And with Joseph being present at his father's death fulfilled God's promise to Jacob, I will go. Down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. The passing of Jacob in the presence of his sons was a deeply moving and dramatic scene and Joseph's command to have Jacob embalmed was a sign of his position of power. In Egypt, the embalming process was a rigorous process and lasted 40 days. And 70 days of mourning was a true sign of Jacob's legacy. Joseph does make a request to bury his dad, Jacob, but he does not simply come out and make the request but explains that Jacob made him swear, like an oath, to do so. We are not told why. Perhaps he thought Pharaoh would not grant the request. But explaining Jacob made him swear to do so, Pharaoh granted him the request. We read earlier in Genesis that Abraham bought this plot of land, so it's assumed the family has. 
access to it, but maybe Jacob had given it up. But despite the situation, Joseph leaves to bury Jacob and promises to return. Along with Joseph goes a large group of people from Pharaoh, including all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, so it's easy to easy that Pharaoh held Joseph, and probably Jacob, in great esteem. For most situations today, all members of the family would attend a family especially for someone who was held in such high regards but for Jacob. While most of the family did attend, the children did not. Not everyone attended but scripture is clear that it was a large gathering. The funeral procession is said to have stopped at the threshing floor of Atad. On the other side of Jordan, which was a place where Joseph and the crowd mourned, at least in part, for seven days. It's hard to know what the locals thought of this large crowd from Egypt. But the Egyptians were there to have a final send-off to a Canaanite. And the crowd, particular Joseph and his brothers, to do as they were instructed. Verse 13 explains the location described in Genesis chapter 23 as Abraham had purchased this cave and field at Machpelah from the Hittites when the time came to bury his wife Sarah. After the funeral and burial of Jacob, Joseph leaves for Egypt, and it explains his brothers go with him. Obviously, Joseph was a great man, blessed, and favored by God, but he was able to keep his calm being around his brothers, who remembered the past just like he did, who knew what they were thinking. Perhaps they thought things would change after Jacob's death. Although Joseph had a high position of power, he still worked for Pharaoh and probably knew he would never see Canaan again. This is only speculation at this point, but it would be fair to assume this. Joseph's brothers think he will turn on them and hate them after Jacob's death. And it's hard for them not to hold this thought after all they did to Joseph. While Christians are instructed to let go of the past and things we've been through, to let go and let God, it's not easy. We still have emotions and our emotions will get the best of us if we do not control them. Joseph's brothers understood their wrongs, but what will Joseph do? Jacob's legacy lived on through his sons as they tried to appease Joseph in the same way Jacob had. With Esau, a message is sent to Joseph from his brothers, allegedly from Jacob, forgive. I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren, and their sin for they did unto the evil. And now, we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. It is very difficult to know for certain whether Jacob made such declarations. These words probably did not come from Jacob, as this was an attempt from Joseph's brothers to avoid any potential retaliation or pay back. Joseph responds with tears, he weeps, probably because he just buried his dad. And now, here's a message from him. There are other possibilities, but we cannot be certain why Joseph wept. But it may have been a combination of factors. The brothers arrive in person and throws down in submission declaring, Behold, we be thy servants. Again, this is similar to what Jacob had done with Esau. Joseph was not a vengeful man, not after all he had witnessed, and decided to let it all go and let God judge the things that had been done to him. What Joseph says next is how all Christians need to live, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. This does not mean we allow people to take advantage of us, but trust God through the entire process. What was meant for Joseph's destruction was used for Joseph's deliverance and victory. Again, Joseph revealed his true character and forgave them, and let them know they have no reason to worry the little ones will be taken care of. We get a picture of the closing of the book of Genesis as Joseph and his brothers are reunited after the death of Jacob 
and Egypt is flourishing. Joseph lives to be 110 years old. And scripture reads Joseph lived to see his great-great-grandchildren through Ephraim, as well as his great-grandchildren through his son Manasseh and grandson Machir. Joseph tells his brothers that he's about to die, but ensures them that God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Notice what Joseph calls his brothers, the sons of Israel. The book of Genesis ends with Joseph dying and being embalmed, the second person to have been involved with embalming, and both happening in the last chapter of Genesis. And what a way for the chapter to end, but before we close out this chapter. And the book of Genesis, make note about Joseph being placed in a coffin. But he was not buried for 400 years, or so after his death. One explanation for this could be Joseph was still an Egyptian slave despite being second in. Command? According to OUTorah.org, the Besher Shore explains that Joseph wanted to be buried in a casket so that his remains could easily be transported back to the land of Israel for interment. Had he been buried directly in the ground, his remains could have deteriorated or the location of his burial could have been forgotten. Let's finish up with words from Spurgeon. Moreover, if I am to gather from the text that the Holy Spirit has singled out the brightest instance of faith in Joseph's whole life, it is beautiful to remark that the grand old man becomes most illustrious in his last hour. Death did not dim, but rather brightened the gold in his character. On his deathbed, Beyond all the rest of his life, his faith, like the setting sun, gilds all around with glory now that heart and flesh fail him, God becomes more than ever the strength of his life, as he was soon to be his portion forever. Is it not a grand thing for a Christian to do his very best action last, being strongest in divine power when his own weakness is supreme? We should desire to serve God in youth, in health, in strength, with all the might we have. But it may happen to us that, like Samson, our last act may be the greatest. Many a good man groans over his life, that having done all he can it is still unsatisfactory. But perhaps the master may be intending to give him a crowning mercy just at the last and make the place of his departure to be the scene his most glorious victory, so that he may enter into heaven wearing the laurels of faith, there to cast them at the Savior's feet. Joseph, at any rate, is a noble instance of faith's conquest over death. This is where we end our program for today with a review of Genesis chapters 41 through 50. This completes the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Genesis is a very hard-hitting book with so much information, which is why we go digging deeper into each verse and chapter. It's not enough to simply read the Bible, but we must understand the Bible. If you have liked what you just saw, please like and share this video. And subscribe to the channel to help us spread the word of God. Each like and share helps the channel grow and your subscription keeps you up to do with all our content. We are always adding so please keep us in mind. Thank you for joining me today. I am Billy Ray Parrish and until next time, stay safe. And God bless.